Celebrating our 22nd year of service to the worldwide amateur radio community, we are This Week in Amateur Radio, your all-amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. This is edition number 1177 with a release and air date of Saturday, September 18th, 2021. Please take the program to your air following the Q-Tone. Now in our 22nd year of service to the amateur radio community around the world, we are This Week in Amateur Radio, North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories for release around the earth as we come to air with edition number 1177 of This Week in Amateur Radio. Due to the ongoing and ever-changing worldwide conditions of the COVID-19 pandemic, a few more amateur radio events scheduled for the near future have either been canceled or are going virtual. We will have all the details. The VOIP WeatherNet activates in both the United States and Canada for Hurricane Larry. The treasurer at the ARRL steps down. Now the league is activating a search for a replacement. The FCC adopts rules for the 6 gigahertz band, opening up 1,200 megahertz of spectrum for unlicensed use. The 2021 ARRL simulated emergency test is coming up soon. The next SpaceX crew to the International Space Station is comprised of four amateurs. We will introduce them to you. Meanwhile, ARIS has received recognition from the NASA Mission Directorate. The Voice of America Relay Station celebrates a birthday, and Ridi Service Station K6KPH is back on the air once again. And one of the oldest broadcast stations in the country is celebrating 100 years on the air. We will tell you who it is in this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio. These headline stories will come to you in a moment along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT and what's new with all of those amateur satellites in orbit. This week, our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, will do his best to unscramble the alphabet soup surrounding that new high-definition television you are looking to buy. Australia's own Arnold Benshoff, VK6FLAB, will tell us how he tackled the Fox Mike Hotel Portable Operations Challenge. Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOI, returns with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives. This week, Bill goes back to the early days of amateur radio and the role that amateurs played in the early days of broadcasting. Our tower climbing and antenna master, Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, will talk about successful installation of tower-mounted electronics. That's all straight ahead, as North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service this Week in Amateur Radio takes to the air right now. Reporting from our headquarters studio here in beautiful downtown Albany, New York, where fall is definitely in the air, although we're having a little bit of Indian summer, I'm George W2XBS. And reporting from the newsroom in Half Moon, New York, I'm Terry Saunders, N1KIN. And broadcasting from our news bureau just outside Albany, New York, in the Geek Cave Studios, I'm Rich Lawrence, KB2MOB. And reporting from our ham radio station atop the Catskill Mountains in western New York, where outside the falling leaves are drifting by the window, those autumn leaves of red and gold, I see your lips, the summer kisses, the sunburned hands I used to... Oh, never mind, I digress. I'm Don Hewlett, K2ATJ. And from Studio One of our Central Florida News Bureau, I'm Fred. November Fox to Fox. And reporting after a quiet week here in our Troy, New York News Bureau, I'm Eric, KD2, RJX. And reporting from our News Bureau in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where we have been promised autumn weather in time for autumn, but autumn can be a fickle lady, I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR, wishing and hoping. And now with this week's lead story, here is Terry Saunders, N1KIN. Leading off this week's news are a few more cancellations of amateur radio events due to the rising concern over the COVID-19 Delta variant. Concerns over large crowds and long-distance travel have taken its toll. The Tokyo Ham Fair 2021 is canceled. The Japan Amateur Radio League has announced the cancellation of Tokyo Ham Fair 2021, which was scheduled for October 2nd and 3rd. 
The JARL says they were hopeful to have Hamfair 2021 with possible preventive measures against COVID-19, but another wave of infection came this summer, said the announcement from Ken Yamamoto, JA1CJP. The 2020 Hamfair was also called off due to the pandemic. According to the JARL website, more than 42,000 people attended the fair in 2019 over the course of two days. Considering the worse-than-expected current COVID situation, the Japan Amateur Radio League reluctantly decided to cancel Hamfair 2021. We hope that Tokyo Ham Fair can come back in 2022 under safer conditions. The 39th AMSAT Space Symposium, planned as an in-person event for late October, will now be a virtual event due to the lingering effects of COVID-19. Initial plans had called for a live event in Bloomington, Minnesota, following last year's virtual symposium. AMSAT President Robert Bankston, KE4AL, said that the AMSAT members voiced concern over the continued coronavirus pandemic and the risks associated with long-distance travel as well as attendance at large gatherings. In the interest of everyone's comfort and safety, we have made the difficult decision to return to a virtual meeting platform, Bankston said. If there's any good news in this, we know that last year's virtual symposium event was well-received and that we have the opportunity to repeat its success this year. Symposium organizers are reviewing the schedule for the event and will adjust it as needed to accommodate the shift from an in-person to a virtual event. Those who already registered for the symposium will automatically receive refunds. Questions regarding the symposium can be sent to info at amsat.com. AMSAT will host its 2021 AMSAT Virtual Space Symposium and annual general meeting via Zoom on Saturday, October 30th from 1400 UTC to 2200 UTC. It will be available to the general public on AMSAT's YouTube channel at no cost. The event will be a combination of pre-recorded video segments along with live questions and answer sessions. Final papers for the symposium proceedings must be submitted by October 18th. You can send those to Dan Schultz, N8FGV. Symposium presentations should be limited to 15 minutes of pre-recorded video and be submitted by October 18th to Paul Stotzter, N8HM. AMSAT asks that presenters be available to take questions via Zoom following their pre-recorded presentations. The International Amateur Radio Union Region 3 is also responding to the worsening pandemic conditions by holding its first digital regional conference. The IARU Region 3 conference kicks off on September 20th, and for its hosting organization, RAST, it was supposed to be three days of business and fellowship in Bangkok, Thailand. It will instead be held digitally, a first for Region 3, but a necessary response to the extraordinary circumstances of the COVID-19 pandemic. RAST's president, Jack Hang Tonkum, HS1FVL, writes on the conference website, We are excited about the opportunities of holding an innovative virtual conference. As such, the member societies will still meet in working groups to deal with technical, operational, and policy matters, typical of any such conference except that this, the 18th Regional Conference, will take place on the Zoom platform. The tentative list of participants on the conference website includes attendees from Orari, the Indonesian Amateur Radio Society, the Chinese Taipei Amateur Radio League, the Chinese Radio Amateurs Club, the American Radio Relay League, and the Malaysian Amateur Radio Transmitter Society, among others. Jack writes further, this conference will bring us together at what is a very difficult time for us all. More details are available on the IARU Region 3 webpage. VO1FJS, VO1IV. VO1IV, VO1FJS, go ahead, sir. Amateur Radio volunteers on the Voice Over the Internet Protocol Weather Network joined Linked Systems in Newfoundland, Canada to collect ground weather data for relay to the National Hurricane Center and Environment Canada as Hurricane Larry hammered the Canadian province on September 11th. With more details, we go to League Headquarters where Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, files this report. Amateur radio volunteers on the Voice Over Internet Protocol Weather Network joined Linked Systems in Newfoundland, Canada to collect ground truth weather data for relay to the National Hurricane Center and Environment Canada as Hurricane Larry hammered the Canadian province on September 11th. 
The Category 1 storm with maximum sustained winds of 85 miles an hour was predicted to bring hurricane force winds, dangerous storm surge, heavy seas, and a lot of rain. Uh, up this way, it's uh, gusting 50 to 60 at the moment. Guamro's falling uh, rapidly, sitting at uh, 1,003 at the moment. 17 degrees Celsius and 200 meter visibility, but I have a feeling that's going to change very soon. Scores of reports, including damage to schools and homes, down trees, power outages and evacuations, were sent by a squad of hams that included Aaron Abbott, VO1IV, and Gareth Robury, VE3GJR. More than 40 personnel hours of operation by Canadian and U.S. radio amateurs were involved in providing the reports received on both systems. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. Rob Macedo, KD1CY, Director of Operations for the VOIP Hurricane Net, said that through the exemplary efforts of VO1IV and a number of amateur radio operators across Newfoundland, and one amateur operator in Ontario who relayed a report from a non-amateur radio Canwarn spotter in St. John's, reports of damage to trees, power lines, power outages, including roof damage to a school and a home, were relayed from amateurs around the region. Can Warn is a volunteer organization of ham radio operators reporting severe weather to Environment Canada, similar to Skywarn spotters in the U.S. The Hurricane Watch Net was activated on September 10th on 20 and 40 meters. The online Kahoku News website reports that on August the 21st, a Japanese radio amateur received a distress call from a vessel off the coast of Niigata Prefecture. In late August, amateur radio enthusiast Yukio Sakurai, aged 59, of Osaki City, received a distress call from a small ship drifting off the coast of Niigata Prefecture and worked with other ham radio enthusiasts to gather information, which led to the rescue of two crew members by the Coast Guard. Around 8.45pm on August the 21st, Sakurai caught a voice in the noise calling SOS SOS. He was located in a parking lot on Mount Toriyumi. He wondered about the possibility of this being someone up to mischief, but when he checked, it turned out to be coming from a drifting ship. He immediately called 110 to contact the police. The report reached the Niigata Coast Guard at their second district headquarters in Shiogama City. The small ship had lost power and could not use its shipshore radio, and the crew's mobile phone did not work. The Coast Guard didn't have any amateur radio facilities. So Mr. Sakurai asked for the name of the crew and the status of the ship via amateur radio, which became the only means of communication, and conveyed information via other amateur radio enthusiasts in Niigata Prefecture. Based on the information they received, the Coast Guard searched the site area and found a small ship at around 2.30 a.m. the following day. Sakurai continued to have communication with the crew and encouraged them to do their best to hold on because rescue was on the way. The two crewmen on board weren't injured. According to the Coast Guard, the vessel broke down on its way to Okinawa after the crew had just purchased it in Hokkaido, drifting about 55 kilometers north-northeast of Sado City. A maritime security official said, We were able to save lives by reporting appropriate information to the people concerned as soon as possible. We are very grateful. Mr Sakurai said that he was glad that he happened to be in a place where radio propagation into the Niigata area was possible. He said, I want you all to know that amateur radio is useful for saving lives. After 10 years of distinguished service to ARRL as its volunteer treasurer, Frederick Rick Niswander, K7GM, has decided to step down when his current term expires in January 2022. Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, has more details on this soon-to-be-vacant ARRL position in this special report from League Headquarters. ARRL is seeking qualified candidates from among its membership. The Board of Directors elects the Treasurer and other officers at its annual meeting in even-numbered years. The Treasurer is a non-voting member of the Board of Directors and must be a radio amateur and full member of the ARRL for four continuous years prior to nomination. For further information, see the full position description at www.arrl.org forward stroke capital T, treasurer, capital P, position. That's all one word, and it is case-sensitive. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME.
The ARRL bylaws define the role of the treasurer as follows. In consultation with and subject to the general supervision of the Administration and Finance Committee, provides for the investment and reinvestment of the surplus funds of the League in any bonds, stocks, or other securities, as would be selected by a trustee with the care of a prudent investor. Provides reports to and attends all regular meetings of the Board of Directors. Serves as a member of the Administration and Finance Committee and, if assigned, subcommittees of the Board or Administrative and Finance Committee. The position is unpaid. However, necessary expenses, including travel to meetings, are reimbursable. For further information, see the full position description. A search committee has been established to recommend one or more candidates for treasurer to the board. Qualified members are invited to submit a statement of interest and qualifications via email to treasurersearch at arrl.org. The deadline is November 12, 2021. The International Amateur Radio Union, the IARU, is the worldwide federation of national amateur radio organizations. The membership of the IARU consists of more than 160 member societies in as many countries and separate territories. It is the representative body for amateur radio in the world. The membership of the IARU consists of its member societies, who have been voted into membership by the member societies. There can be only one member society in each country or separate territory. So, for example, the Wireless Institute of Australia is recognised as the lead body for amateur radio in Australia. The IARU is recognised by the United Nations as a non-governmental organisation by virtue of its consultative status with other United Nations bodies, such as the International Telecommunication Union. The IARU has worked with the ITU for nearly a century and is a member of the radio communications sector, playing a full part in the work of the ITU as it affects amateur radio spectrum. And it's also in the development sector, relating to developing countries and emergency communications. The International Amateur Radio Union has been the worldwide voice of radio amateurs since 1925, securing and safeguarding the amateur radio spectrum. The three IARU regions are organised to broadly mirror the structure of the International Telecommunications Union and its related regional telecommunications organisations. Region 1 represents Europe, Africa, the Middle East and Northern Asia. Region 2 covers the Americas and Region 3 represents the Asia-Pacific region. In September of this year, the IARU Region 3 will hold its three-yearly conference virtually, hosted by the Radio Amateur Society of Thailand. We all realise that our world has been shaken by COVID-19. The pandemic has forced us all to work in ways only made possible through technology. Planning for the 2021 conference started nearly three years ago. The expectation was to run this in Bangkok City, Thailand. The COVID-19 pandemic has prevented the IARU from attending a conference on site and the hosts are excited about the opportunities of holding an innovative virtual conference. Member societies will have smaller than usual delegations who will attend the event online. The final agenda has not been published at this time, but members will be kept informed. The El Dorado Amateur Radio Club has been providing radio communication support for small and large animal rescue efforts during the Caldor Fire in California. Members of the South County Large Animal Rescue Group, El Dorado County Animal Services, and other volunteers have been addressing the need Many of the El Dorado County Amateur Radio Club volunteers are also members of the club's Neighborhood Radio Watch program. As the Caldor Fire destroyed the community of Grizzly Flats, threatened Lake Tahoe, and caused evacuations in dozens of communities throughout the county, thousands of area residents were forced to flee their homes without having time to round up their pets and livestock. We desperately love our animal companions, whether big or small, and being separated and unable to care for them in the midst of a disaster is truly heart-wrenching, said Alan Thompson, W6WN, the club's public information officer. Because of the mountainous terrain, many of our neighbors already had little or no cell or internet communication, and the fire only made things worse. Thompson said the club quickly deployed its mobile Aries communication center, maintained by Jay Harmer, KE6GLA, which is in service as Central Net Operations. Several members stepped up, including Dale Dennis, KJ6HHY from Yolo Aries, and Tom Newman, NN6H from Alameda County Races and part of the Alameda County Sheriff's Communications Team to volunteer their time and radios to accompany the animal rescue teams dispatched into impacted areas. 
teams of South County Large Animal Rescue Group members, animal service personnel, public employees, and radio communication staff have been conducting daily animal rescue missions and welfare checks throughout the impacted areas. Until residents are permitted to return, these teams are providing food, water, and care to abandoned animals. Thompson said those seeking an animal evacuation or welfare check should contact El Dorado County Animal Services as follows on the Western Slope. You would call 530-621-5795 or the shelter at 530-621-7631. In the South Tahoe area, call 530-573-7925. South County Large Animal Rescue Group will respond as directed by El Dorado County Animal Services. They cannot self-deploy or respond directly to phone calls for assistance, Thompson said. The weekend of October 2nd and 3rd is designated for holding the annual ARRL Simulated Emergency Test although local and section-wide exercises may take place throughout the fall. With more information on the upcoming SET, we go to League Headquarters, where Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, files this report. The SET is ARRL's primary national emergency exercise, and it's designed to assess the skills and preparedness of amateur radio emergency service volunteers as well as those affiliated with other organizations involved in emergency and disaster response. The set encourages maximum participation by all radio amateurs, partner organizations, and national, state, and local officials who typically engage in emergency or disaster response. In addition to ARIES volunteers, those active in the national traffic system, Radio Amateur Civil Emergency Service, or RACES, National Weather Service, Skywarn volunteers, community emergency response teams, and a variety of other allied groups and public service-oriented radio amateurs are needed to fulfill important roles in this nationwide exercise. The set offers volunteers an opportunity to test their equipment, modes, and skills under simulated emergency conditions and scenarios. To get involved, contact your local ARRL emergency coordinator or net manager. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. The annual simulated emergency test encourages maximum participation by all amateur radio operators, partner organizations, and national, state, and local officials who typically engage in emergency or disaster response. Individuals can use the time to update a go kit for use during deployments and to ensure their home station's operational capability in an emergency or disaster. Once again, to get involved with the simulated emergency test, contact your local ARRL emergency coordinator or net manager. Check on upcoming planned activities through local, state, or section-wide nets. Four radio amateurs will head to the International Space Station aboard a commercial flight, thanks to Amateur Radio on the International Space Station. With more details on this flight, we go to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME who files this report from League Headquarters. Four radio amateurs will be heading to the International Space Station aboard a commercial flight. They are Rajachari, KI5LIU, Tom Marshburn, KE5HOC, Kayla Barron, KI5LAL, and Matthias Moira, KI5KFH, a European Space Agency astronaut. Launch from Kennedy Space Center in Florida won't happen any earlier than October 31st. The launch will mark the third SpaceX crew. NASA's commercial crew program provides transportation to and from the ISS. Crew 3 is expected to spend six months aboard the orbiting laboratory as part of what's expected to be a seven-member crew. Mission teams have a target launch date of no earlier than next April 15th for the launch of the SpaceX Crew-4 mission. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. As the most experienced space traveler, Moyer, who is a European Space Agency astronaut, could end up making a very heavy work schedule. 
The launch will mark the third SpaceX Crew Dragon spacecraft and Falcon 9 rocket launch combination as part of NASA's commercial crew program, which provides reliable and affordable transportation to and from the ISS. The crew is scheduled for a long-duration stay aboard and the orbiting laboratory, living and working as part of what's expected to be a seven-member crew. The launch will be the first spaceflight for Chari, Baron, and Moyer, and the third for Washburn. The crew will complete a six-month science mission aboard the microgravity laboratory that's in low Earth orbit. NASA's SpaceX Crew-3 will be the third crew rotation mission with astronauts on an American rocket and spacecraft from the U.S. to the space station, and the fourth flight with astronauts including the Demo-2 test flight in 2020, the Crew-1 mission in 2021, and the ongoing Crew-2 flight as part of the Expedition 65 crew. Crew-3 astronauts plan to arrive at the station to overlap with NASA's astronauts Shane Kimbrough, KE-5HOD, and Megan MacArthur, Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency astronaut Ahiko Koshide, KE-5DNI, and ESA astronaut Thomas Pesquat, KG-5FYG, who flew to the station as part of the agency's SpaceX Crew-2 mission in April of 2021. NASA's commercial crew program is working with industry standards to become a public-private partnership to provide safe, reliable, and cost-effective transportation to and from the International Space Station, which will allow for additional research time and will increase the opportunity for discovery aboard humanity's testbed for exploration. The space station remains the springboard to space exploration, including future missions to the Moon and Mars. For launch coverage and more information about the mission, visit the NASA website. Steve, Echo India 5 Delta Delta, has revised the content of the Digital Radio Operating Manual to include Northern Ireland digital repeater systems and digital gateways. The content includes a basic tutorial covering the programming of DMR radios, as well as general information about DMR, C4FM and DSTAR. Repeater roaming and GPS operation via DMR is also included, along with the setup for Hytera and Motorola radios. Talk group lists for the whole of Ireland and the UK are provided with the preferred use of time slots. There are maps of repeater coverage networks and extensive talk group lists for the Brandmeister network, the Phoenix network and the DMR Plus network. The information contained in this operating manual should facilitate programming and understanding of the various DMR networks. And copies of the manual can be found on the EI7GL blog at echoindia7golflima.blogspot.com and also on the front page of the Galway Radio Club website. Coming up next, which TV should I buy? And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. This gives me an excuse to kind of explain all of this alphabet soup that's around modern TVs. I'll start off by saying there really are two technologies you should be aware of for LCD or big screen flat panel displays. There's LCD and that is even if it says QLED or LED, it's still an LCD. The way LCDs work, liquid crystal displays work, is kind of like a shutter. The liquid crystal is actually a shutter that opens and closes very rapidly. Behind it, there is a backlight. Now, the backlight is white. It is as pure a white light as they can get. Uh, and there are a variety of ways of generating that. In the old days, it used to be fluorescent. Now, it's almost always LED, hence the LED in the name. But it's still a liquid crystal display with shuttering. And, of course, it does red, green, and blue. And it changes those appropriately to, if you give you the right colors. So most of the time, when you're talking about different technologies with LCD TVs, you're really talking about the backlight. And there are varieties of ways of doing this. Uh, Scott Wilkinson will talk about something called FALD, which is full array local dimming. That is basically, when we had uh, fluorescent tubes, you'd have a few fluorescent tubes. And you might have noticed some hot spots, some brighter spots. It wasn't even. With full array local dimming, you have a full array of LEDs. They're cheaper than fluorescents. They're also more reliable behind the liquid crystal shutters so that there is an even amount of light on almost every pixel. That's important. And local dimming is great because it means instead of just 
opening and closing the shutter to a certain degree to make it brighter or darker. You can even turn the backlight in, an, in a local area down or off, which gives you a broader dynamic range, darker blacks, brighter whites. That's always something that's been a problem on LCDs. LCDs are very bright. They're great for brightly lit rooms. They're also the least expensive technology out there. But they've always had an issue uh, compared to the older plasma technology and the newer OLED technology. They just didn't have the, the dynamic range, the, the high dynamic range of darkest darks and brightest brights because this backlight couldn't be dimmed. So FALD, full array local dimming, is the most recent technology to help you get a broader dynamic range of lighting on your TV. And that really helps. The most important thing, frankly, if you ask me, among all the specs, we talk about UHD or 4K. That's the number of dots on the screen. We also talk about HDR. That is the most important spec, high dynamic range range because the broader the dynamic range the more like real world lighting it looks like even today tvs photography very few things can cover the full array of brightness and darkness that your eyes can but the closer they come the more natural the more realistic it'll look and nowadays since many movies are shot in hdr many sources are hdr it really does make a difference in the quality. I think more than the resolution, especially with a big screen like that, you're going to be sitting at a, dist a little bit of a distance, 10 feet probably or, or more from the TV. The number of pixels per inch is less important than the HDR. So HDR is good, and I would recommend it. I should mention that if you're, and you're looking at these 4K TVs, you will not get the benefit of a 4K TV or HDR unless your input sources support 4K HDR as well. This is something that happens to people when they buy these new TVs, you know, 500 bucks, great deal. And then they realize, but I'm not getting 4K pictures because you're using an old cable box or an old Roku or an old Apple TV. You will be upgrading if you want to get that full benefit of those beautiful TVs. The sources, your cable box can go to 4K, call your cable company. There are 4K Rokus, the Roku Ultra, Apple TV comes in 4K as well. If you use an AV receiver, it will also have to be 4K. So if you're pumping your Apple TV into a receiver and then into your TV, you're going to have to upgrade the receiver as well. I ended up buying everything new in order to support my TV. Now, the best pictures in 4K are actually not LCD. I think they've made some great progress. QLED is, is really good. Fall, full array local dimming, as I mentioned, is really good. But the best picture in uh, flat screen TVs these days is OLED. Uh, they don't make plasmas anymore. OLED's the best. It is more expensive. Problem is you can't tell at the Costco because they're set on the demo mode, which is a very bright, colors are extra vivid to make you go, ooh, that looks good. That's not what you want. When you get it home, you're going to turn that off, put it in cinema mode. The colors will be more muted. The light will be not quite as bright. It'll be more natural. When your eyes get used to that, it's actually preferable. It's a much more accurate picture, but that's never what they show in the store. So it's very hard to, to judge side-by-side -side TVs. There's one more thing to consider in both of these, and that's the software. Smart TVs. That means you can run Netflix, YouTube. You might even be able to run a browser in them. I caution you against using that as a way to choose TVs. Because in most cases, smart TVs, the software is not as good as the same software running on a Roku or an Apple TV. They're not kept as up to date. It's not unusual, for instance, I have Samsung TVs that the browsers are no longer useful because they've expired and they haven't been keeping them up to date. You'll also find with Samsung anyway, uh, they put ads in the smart TV interface. I'm not a big fan of that. I don't want to see ads for Samsung products. In some cases, you can turn that off. But I would, if, if you think you're going to use the smart TV features, I would look at them and make sure, A, that the usability is good. I think Samsung and LG both are, are fairly good in that regard. But you might want to try it to make sure you agree. You like the remote. Uh, I think, again, that's more a matter of personal taste than actual technical differences. I think they're both pretty good. And I would take a look at the, interf the, the interface for the smart TV if they're showing you ads. You should also read, I know this is a lot of work, but you might want to also read the privacy statement. One of the reasons I'm not a fan of smart TVs in general is they very often, in fact, I would say almost universally, certainly with Samsung, and I bet with LG too, 
uh, watch what you're watching and send that information back to marketers for advertising and ratings purposes. You may not want that. What I generally do with smart TVs, I don't connect them to the internet. I, w I don't want the smart features and I really don't want the privacy invasion when you don't connect a TV like that to the internet, it can't do that. It can't watch what you're watching. It can't put ads on the screen, it, but you won't be able to use the smart TV features. So that's another reason to recommend getting a good Roku Ultra or an Apple TV 4K, plugging that into the TV and using that uh, instead of using the uh, Samsung or LG smart TV features. It is a good idea to check to see if you're getting the latest model. It's going to be a little tricky because when they sell in big box stores, a lot of companies and both Samsung and LG are doing this, use model numbers that don't match what they use when they sell in other places. So you can't compare models. Often the models sewn in the big box, sold in the big box stores are older. They're last year's TV. And normally with both LG and Samsung, that model number would tell you what year it is but they've changed these so that you you can't tell. You might do a Google search on UN7300 or TU700D to see what model year that is. Not the worst thing in the world. That's one of the reasons they're very affordable. If it's last year's model, there haven't been big leaps forward in technology. It's just something to be aware of. 65 inches is a good size. Uh, it really does depend on how close you are to the TV. 65 inches is okay for 10 feet. But if you're going to be 15 feet or more behind, you're going to want to get a bigger TV because ideally this TV is almost a cinema-like experience. Ideally, you want it to you know, cover 45, 50 degrees uh, of view. It's not going to be 90 degrees, but you don't want to be looking left and right. It's not like you're sitting in the front row of the movie theater. But you want enough so that you know your peripheral vision is actually seeing something. So that's about 50 degrees, something like that. Maybe, I don't know, maybe that's 90 degrees. So you, you want to be fairly close to it. There are online guides to viewing angle and distance and the appropriate size. 65 is pretty big, but there's some things to think about uh, in terms of the technologies. Anyway, I'm glad you were here and I'm here and I'll be here next week. And I hope you'll come by and bring your friends too as we talk high tech. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Are you ready for another trip into amateur radio history? I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY, and I'll be back in a moment with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives, here on This Week in Amateur Radio. Welcome to the Ancient Amateur Archives. I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY. On November 2nd, 1920, Warren G. Harding was elected President of the United States. Millions read the election results in the newspapers the next day. In the Pittsburgh area, however, hundreds heard the election returns the moment they were wired in, thanks to Dr. Frank Conrad, a Westinghouse employee who broadcast the results over 8XK, his amateur station. This station would evolve into KDKA, and the night of November 2nd, 1920, has been called the start of the multi-billion dollar broadcast industry. But was it? This month, let's take a look at the evolution of broadcasting and the amateur's role in it. The idea of broadcasting was first considered by Lee DeForest in May 1902, when he wrote that, ultimately, wireless telephony will be possible. He urged the financial backers of the DeForest Wireless Telegraph Company to develop and patent the concept. The stockholders, however, were more interested in immediate profits through massive stock sales rather than genuine development and refused to finance the necessary research. Undaunted, DeForest in 1907 formed the DeForest Radio Telephone Company. In a statement that for 1907 must have appeared to be radical or even bizarre, but was amazingly prophetic, he wrote, I look forward to the day when opera may be brought into every home. Someday the news and even advertising will be sent out over the wireless telephone. Despite DeForest's intense interest in this area, he was not the first to broadcast the human voice and music over the airwaves. That honor belongs to Reginald Fessenden, a Canadian professor. He was the first to recognize the inherent flaw in the concept of spark transmissions 
and set out to find an alternative. His quest led him to Schenectady, New York, and the services of General Electric's most brilliant scientist, Charles Steinmetz. Fessenden explained his idea, an alternator capable of generating waves of 100,000 cycles per second, or 3,000 meters. Steinmetz and his assistant, Ernst Alexanderson, worked for almost two years and finally produced an alternator that met Fessenden's requirements. The Alexanderson alternator, as it was now known, was delivered to Fessenden Station in the fall of 1906. On the evening of December 24, 1906, ship and amateur operators heard something in their headphones they had never heard before. Someone speaking. A woman singing. Someone reading a poem. Fessenden himself played the violin. Not to be outdone, DeForest continued his radio telephone experiments in the period of 1907 through 1910, broadcasting from the Eiffel Tower and live from the stage of the Metropolitan Opera, where Enrico Caruso was singing. However, all of these transmissions had one major problem. Without a pure, stable, direct, current CW carrier to modulate, all of the signals had a background whine and distortion. Real development in the area of modulated carriers would have to wait until Armstrong discovered the oscillating properties of a regenerative circuit. By 1916, both Armstrong's circuit and the Audion were widely circulating in the radio world and broadcasting surfaced again. Lee DeForest resumed his transmissions with programs of good music, culture, and lectures. DeForest can be credited with two firsts in 1916. The first advertisements for his Audion and other products and the broadcast of the presidential election between Woodrow Wilson and Charles Evans Hughes. Unfortunately, DeForest signed off before the California results were in, so he declared Hughes the winner over Wilson. Also in 1916, amateur station 2ZK broadcast one hour of music each night. David Sarnoff, who had manned his station during the Titanic disaster, also got into the act. He wrote a memo to his employers at American Marconi, suggesting a radio music box, which would become a household utility. He went on to describe his vision of radio broadcasting and then turned to finances. He predicted an income of $75 million a year from the sales of receivers. Marconi, still focusing on ship-to-shore telegraphy, took no action on the memo. After amateurs had returned to the air in November of 1919, hundreds of them began to explore the area of broadcasting. In May 1920, amateur station 8XK joined many other hams in the transmission of music. Incidentally, it was legal for amateurs to broadcast music, news, sports, lectures, advertisements, or indeed just about anything else they wanted. The Radio Act of 1912, still in effect, did not mention amateurs. Rather, one paragraph made a general reference to individual private or commercial stations. The only real restriction was the 1 kilowatt power limit and the 200 meter wavelength. After that, the government didn't care. Thus, those amateurs who had built equipment to modulate their CW transmitters eventually played a phonograph record or two, sang, or tried to sing, or broadcast some form of entertainment. With all of the above documented evidence, why is November 2nd, 1920 considered the start of broadcasting? The answer lies not at the transmitter, but at the receiver. Prior to that night, all broadcasts had, in effect, been from one amateur to another or to a commercial station. The November broadcast, though, was designed and promoted by Westinghouse as a transmission to the general public. Starting in September, stores were selling basic receivers for $10 to receive 8XK. Westinghouse, in effect, had seized DeForest and Sarnoff's idea and was marketing it to the general public. Thus, it was the makeup of the listening audience that defined the start of broadcasting. When the word of this successful transmission got out, more amateurs got into the act and set up their own little broadcast stations. By the end of 1921, it was estimated that about 1,200 amateurs had made at least one broadcast. Some had a regular schedule of programs and would evolve into commercial stations. Others did it just out of curiosity. But there were listeners. Over 400,000 people heard the Dempsey-Carpenter fight on July 2, 1921. Radio sales were approaching 100,000 per year, not counting crystal sets, which were selling at the rate of 20,000 per month. However, with this explosive growth came two problems for the amateur. The first was an identity crisis. 
What should the role of the amateur be in broadcasting? Some thought that we should stay out of it and just stick to traffic handling on CW. Others envisioned the amateur as a jack of all trades, expert CW operator and relay station, as well as community broadcaster. In fact, a new name evolved to describe this amateur broadcast hybrid, citizen radio or wireless. Even QST was confused. For a period of time in 1921, the word citizen replaced amateur on the front cover. The other problem was frequencies. Everyone, amateur, broadcaster, and hybrid was on 200 meters. Tuning across the dial in 1921, one would hear mostly CW, a few spark holdouts, and the new broadcasters. While the amateurs were used to the interference, the general listening public was not. They had purchased their radios to hear music, not CW. Complaints started to pour into the Secretary of Commerce. Legally, he was powerless as the Radio Act of 1912 offered no solutions. A conference was called for all interested parties held in Washington in February 1922 to try to resolve the impending crisis. Even though he was exceeding his authority under the Radio Act, Secretary Hoover was able to get the following proposals accepted at the conference. 1. Henceforth, special broadcast licenses would be issued. Two frequencies would be available for broadcasters immediately. 360 meters, or 833 kilocycles, for regular transmissions, and 485 meters, or 619 kilocycles, for crop reports and weather forecasts. 2. After the marine interest had abandoned the 220 to 545 meter range, or 1363 to 550 kilocycles, it would be turned over to broadcasting. 3. Broadcasting was forbidden by amateurs who were defined for the first time by its name, as stations operating without pay or commercial gain merely for personal interest. 4. Quiet hours were imposed on all amateur stations effective from 8 p.m. to 10.30 p.m. daily and on Sunday morning. The fact that the number of broadcasting stations dropped from 1,200 to 30 immediately after these regulations went into effect shows just how many amateurs were in fact pioneer broadcasters. This agreement, however, was a house of cards. Secretary Hoover had stretched his authority under the Radio Act of 1912 well past the breaking point. In 1926, the cards came tumbling down and the summer of anarchy was ushered in. How would amateurs fare with no enforceable regulations in place? Join us the next time as the Ancient Amateur Archives explores the events leading up to the creation of the Federal Radio Commission. Your time is up. Go in peace, but return again for our next installment of the Ancient Amateur Archives. This is November 3, Victor Echo Mike, with your month ending August 2021 Parks on the Air update. Be sure to visit parksontheair.com for more information about the program and puta.app for spotting, park information, leaderboards, and more. This month in Parks on the Air news, we have two exciting updates to share with everybody. Uh, first, we are excited to announce that we have recently added over 1,000 parks to the Parks on the Air system. For the last several months, we've had a small contingent of volunteers combing through user requests to add additional parks, validating that those requested parks meet the criteria for inclusion in PODA, and formatting the list so that they could be added to the system. After hundreds of volunteer hours, the lists are now in the system and ready for you to go activate. Check out the maps and search pages at PODA.app to see if any of these new units are in your area. Also in PODA news, we are excited to share that we are formalizing a Parks on the Air support desk. You can always continue to get community support via the Facebook group or via the POTA help channel in the POTA Slack group, but we have a small group of volunteers that have agreed to be on a rotating schedule to help you with your official technical support questions. To reach the official POTA support desk, all you need to do is send an email to help at parksontheair.com. We have coverage for most days of the week, so you will usually get a response within 24 hours, but no worse than 48 hours based on our volunteers' schedules. We won't solve every problem that fast, but you'll know that we're on it. Issues requiring level 2 support are generally resolved within the week. And now for our monthly update. 
August was a very busy month for Parks on the Air. During the month, there were over 180,000 contacts made by about 1,200 different activators. They put nearly 3,000 parks on the air from 25 different DX entities, and all of those parks and entities were hunted by more than 23,000 different hunters. The top activators for the month were K7CAR with 3,399 QSOs, and W0YES, who activated 72 different parks. The top hunter for the month was N5HA with 967 QSOs while hunting 691 different parks. In our POTA DX corner, Canada was unsurprisingly the most active entity outside of the continental United States, with 12,382 QSOs being made from parks in the Great White North. Not to be outdone, however, we had quite a bit of activity from Japan, Alaska, Puerto Rico, England, Wales, France, and many others. The top DX activators for the month were VE9MY with 1,579 QSOs and VE2NCG who activated 26 parks. And this concludes our August 2021 Parks on the Air update. As always, the team at Parks on the Air wishes you safe activations and happy hunting. 73. It's time for this week's Propagation Forecast Report. Tad Cook, K7RA in Seattle, reports that sunspot numbers started strong at 124 this reporting week, September 9th through the 15th, but ended at zero. Average daily sunspot numbers went from 64.6 to 58.3, and the average daily solar flux declined from 92.9 .9 to 87.4. Geomagnetic indicators remained moderate with last week's average daily planetary A index unchanged at 7 and average daily middle latitude A index changed from 7.7 .7 to 6.9. Looking ahead, the predicted solar flux is much lower than last week's bulletin reported. Solar flux is predicted at 75 on September 17th through the 23rd, 76 on September 24th through the 26th, 78, 80, and 82 on September 27th through the 29th, 86 on September 30th through October 10th, 82 on October 11th through the 12th, 80 on October 13th, and 78 on October 14th through the 17th. Taking a look now at the predicted planetary A and DICE, it will be 15 on September 17th and 18th, 8 on September 19th and 20th, 5 and 8 on September 21st and 22nd, 5 on September 23rd through October 3rd, 8 and 12 on October 4th and 5th, and five on October 16th, all the way through the 17th. Foundations of Amateur Radio. Getting on air and making noise is what it's all about. So last week, that's exactly what we did. Randall, Victor Kilo 6, Whiskey Romeo, Jishnu, Victor Kilo 6, Juliet November, and I participated in the Fox Mike Hotel Portable Operations Challenge, which is specifically scored to deal with power and mode differences between stations by using a handicap system that they liken to playing golf. Having been the winner of the Sir Donald Bradman Award in the Milmarin Memorial Golf Tournament for making the highest score on the day, this speaks to me in more ways than I can say. In case you're wondering, more hits in golf is bad, and I'm not a golfer. Scoring in the Portable Ops Challenge is based around four different attributes. The power you're using, the nature of your station, portable or fixed, the mode used, and the number of transmitters in use. To achieve this, you exchange a Maidenhead grid square, a combination of letters and numbers that indicates your location on Earth, which is then used to determine how many kilometers per watt are used to make the contact. If you're portable, you get a multiplier benefit in the scoring. Depending on the perceived difficulty of the contact, you score more points. In this case, SSB is harder than CW, which in turn is harder than a digital mode. Finally, the more transmitters you have, the less each contact is worth. Two transmitters means you score half the points for each. With that in mind, a QRP portable station with a single transmitter calling CQ on SSB is the best way to make points, and that is something I'm always up for. In our adventure, we opted for a slight change. Instead, using FT4 and FT8, using 40 watts, portable on the side of a hill in a local park, and during the four hours we were active, we managed six contacts, one over SSB, the rest using digital modes, and we all had several goes at getting the best out of our station. Our setup consisted of a small folding table next to my car with a computer, a radio, and a thermos flask with hot tea to ward off the chill in the air. 
Power was supplied by an 80 amp hour battery. The radio was an ICOM IC7300 that Randall brought along. The antenna we used was a Turlin Outbacker multi-tap whip that was attached to my car, with a 12 meter counterpoise rung along the gutter. None of us had ever seen such excellent conditions with such a low noise floor in the middle of the city. We were enjoying the last warm sun of the day from Kings Park in Perth, Western Australia. It's a 990 acre park, larger than Central Park in New York, set aside for public use in 1831 and gazetted as a public park in 1872. The park is open 24 hours a day and features a botanic garden with thousands of species of Western Australia's native flora and fauna, overlooks the Central Business District, the Swan River and the Darling Ranges, and best of all, there's no radio noise. It did get chilly towards the end, but I'm pretty sure we all went home with all our fingers and toes intact. Jishnu also brought along his FT817 and a tiny multi-tap telescopic whip that we strapped to a nearby steel rubbish bin, and using that setup was able to detect and transmit whisper signals across the globe as part of experimentation with his station. One of the unexpected benefits of not yelling CQ into a microphone ad nauseum was that we were able to continue our conversation, hearing stories from each other and enjoying hot pizza when dinner time came around, without needing to stuff food into the same place where CQ calls were intended to originate. My car isn't quite ready to go completely portable, but this little outing again proved to me that portable vehicle-based operation has a charm all its own, and the Fox Mike Hotel Portable Operations Challenge is going to be on my dance card next time it comes around. When was the last time you left your shack and went portable? I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima, Alpha Bravo. Thailand's National Society, RAST, reports that Hotel Sierra 18 India Alpha Romeo Uniform is now active on all bands to promote the forthcoming IARU Region 3 conference. The special call sign, issued by Thailand's National Broadcasting and Telecommunications Commission, is to promote the conference that will be hosted online by RAST in September. The call sign will remain active until September 30th, 2021. The International Amateur Radio Union Region 3 Conference will take place on September the 20th to the 23rd and will be the first ever virtual IARU conference. RAST will host the event online for the safety and convenience for all participants. The virtual IARU conference will have a wide range of remote speakers and will be conducted under the leadership of RAST President Dr. Jack Hantong Kom, Hotel Sierra One, Foxtrot Victor Lima, who is also an IARU Region 3 Director. For stations that make contact with the special call sign HS18 IARU, a QSL card can be applied for by sending a stamped addressed envelope to the Royal Amateur Society of Thailand under the patronage of His Majesty the King, Hotel Sierra 18 India Alpha Romeo Uniform, PO Box 2008, Bangkok 10501, Thailand. Respondents living overseas should include funds to cover return postage for a direct card, and QSL cards will be delivered in November 2021. An online logbook can be checked at www.qrz.com. And papers to be discussed at the conference can be downloaded from www.iaru-r3conf2021.org. That's www.iaru-r3conf2021.org. The ARRL has awarded a Colvin grant of $5,000 to Amateur Radio D Expeditions, the Norwegian nonprofit organization that is sponsoring the 3YOJ D Expedition to Bouvet Island next fall. Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, has more from League Headquarters. Co-leaders for the effort are Ken Opsgar, LA7GIA, Runa Uya, LA7THA, and Erwan Marion, LV1QI. A Colvin grant in the same amount was returned after the Intrepid DX group had to drop its plans for an early 2023 Bouvet D expedition that would have used the same call sign. The multinational team plans to activate Bouvet in November 2022. A dependency of Norway, Bouvet is a sub-Antarctic island in the South Atlantic, and it's the second most wanted DXCC entity behind North Korea. The last Bouvet activation was 3Y0E during a scientific expedition over the winter of 2007-2008. So you can expect the pileups will be huge. 
Amateur Radio D Expeditions, the 3YJ team would field a team of 12 operators for a 20-day stay on Bouvet. The Colvin Award is funded by an endowment established by the legendary DX couple Lloyd Colvin, W6KG, and Iris Colvin, W6QL, both now silent keys. With an overall budget of $650,000, the Bouvet D Expedition will be the most expensive ever. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. Amateur Radio D Expeditions would field a team of 12 operators for a 20-day stay on Bouvet, setting up at Cape Fee in the southeastern part of the island, which the D Expedition organizers call the only feasible part where the D Expedition can safely set up camp on rocky ground. We will not set up camp on the glacier. The D Expedition has a goal of 120,000 contacts during its stay. The Colvin Award is intended to support amateur radio projects that promote international goodwill in the field of DX. Grantees must be groups with a favorable DX track record and with experience directly related to the proposed enterprise. The proposed project must have a goal of significant achievement in the field of DX. Preference is given to multinational groups, all of whom are members of their own IARU member societies. In August, the Northern California DX Foundation donated $100,000 to the 3YOJ D Expedition. The Northern California DX Foundation is now the D Expedition's lead sponsor. We wish to recognize and thank the Northern California DX Foundation. We wish to recognize and thank the Northern California DX Foundation as the lead sponsor to our 3YOJ D Expedition to Bouvet, the 3YOJ team set. Without the support of the Northern California DX Foundation, operations to the world's rarest entities would be difficult. On September 11th, the 3YOJ D Expedition announced the donation of $11,815 from the German DX Foundation. Visit the 3YOJ D Expedition website or Facebook page for more information or to donate to the effort. Steve Goodgame, K5 ATA of Batesville, Mississippi, has joined the staff at ARRL headquarters in Newington, Connecticut. With more details on this new appointment, we go to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, reporting from League Headquarters. He'll serve as manager of the Education and Learning Department, formerly the Lifelong Learning Department. He had consulted for the department as an instructional designer and was instrumental in the implementation of ARRL's Learning Network webinars. Good Game was recently a guest of ARRL's On the Air podcast, where he discussed the ARRL handbook and how it can be useful even to new radio amateurs. One of the biggest things that I guess I made mistakes on at the beginning was um, things like selecting feed lines and th you know antenna systems and all those things that you need at the very beginning to get on the air. I mean, you're not going to get on the air without an antenna and a feed line. There's a loss chart in there that tells you what kind of loss you can expect from different kinds of feed line at different frequencies. Just having that would have saved me a ton of money. <laughs> I mean, there's no telling how much money I spent on RG58 only to find out that was not the right feed line for what I was trying to do. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. Good Game teaches middle school computer science and is in his second year of teaching amateur radio to students at his school. I've been teaching ham radio in some form for 20 years, he said. Over the past three years, we've had close to 60 middle and high school students earn their licenses, and several have upgraded. Good Game's favorite ham radio activity is activating parks in the Parks on the Air program with his daughter Jerrica, KI5HTA. His wife, Cindy, is K5CYN. Good Game hosts the K5ATA Ham Radio YouTube channel. He is a volunteer examiner and a volunteer firefighter. Remember Bob and Doug? No, not the fictional McKenzie brothers from the Great White North, but the NASA astronauts. In August of 2020, Bob Behnken, KE5GGX, and Doug Hurley became the first astronauts launched aboard a Crew Dragon spacecraft in a historic commercial flight. This year, Bob and Doug were to play key roles in the splashdown stage of another history-making mission called Inspiration4. Well, at least their namesakes were ready. Two vessels in SpaceX's recovery fleet were named for the pair in a nod to last year's mission, which helped signal a new era in spaceflight. The ships bearing their names became part of the recovery fleet for Inspiration4, which, with a crew of four private citizens aboard, marked the world's first all-civilian spaceflight. Another autonomous booster recovery drone ship, recently seen off the California coast, bears the name Just Read the Instructions. 
There are other ships in the fleet with intriguing names like a shortfall of Gravitas. NASA is calling on all teachers and students in the USA to submit experiments for possible suborbital flights as a way of gaining first-hand experience with the design and testing process used by NASA researchers. The NASA TechRise Student Challenge invites students to design, build and launch experiments on suborbital rockets and high-altitude balloons. The challenge aims to inspire a deeper understanding of Earth's atmosphere, space exploration, coding, electronics and the value of test data. NASA Administrator Bill Nelson said that it is central to NASA's mission to inspire and educate the workforce of the future. The research areas students can explore through TechRise are endless, from technology to a better understanding of our planet and to innovative systems for deep space exploration. NASA hopes to see entries from students across the USA, showcasing the diverse talent and ideas of the next generation. Guided by an educator, student teams affiliated with US public, private and charter schools can develop and submit creative experimental ideas. The entry period is open from now until November the 3rd, 2021. Each winning team will receive $1,500 to build their experiment and an assigned spot to test it on a NASA-sponsored suborbital flight operated by Blue Origin, UP Aerospace or Raven Aerostar. Flying experiments on suborbital rockets and high-altitude balloons takes technologies from ground-based laboratories into relevant testing environments. The flights replicate microgravity, solar exposure, radiation, extreme temperatures, vacuum and intense vibration. Understanding how payloads respond to these conditions allows researchers to validate their designs and to adjust or make improvements as needed. To enter the competition, teams should submit their experimental ideas online using the TechRise proposed framework. NASA plans to announce the competition winners in January 2022. The selected student teams will build their experiments and watch them take flight in early 2023. NASA and Future Engineers, the Challenge Administrator, will hold a TechRise virtual field trip on Friday, September the 24th to share more information about the challenge and inspire research questions and experimental ideas. Educators and students can tune in to hear from NASA experts and special guest Dr. Raven Baxter, also known as Dr. Raven the Science Maven, and explore on-demand educational content at their own pace. Interested participants can register online. In addition, various resources on the Challenge website aim to help students choose a vehicle and plan experiments on topics ranging from climate, remote sensing to microgravity research. Dr. Baxter said that it was an honour to be part of the virtual field trip, and he couldn't wait to work directly with students who will build and test designs that will explore microgravity. The goal is to inspire them, and I'm sure their ideas will inspire us, he said. NASA is also seeking volunteers to help judge the entries. US residents with expertise in engineering, space and or atmospheric research who are interested in reviewing NASA TechRise submissions can apply to be a judge. For challenge details, visit www.futureengineers.org. NASA's Flight Opportunities Program, based at the agency's Armstrong Flight Research Center in Edwards, California, manages the challenge. The program is part of NASA's Space Technology Mission Directorate. Time now for the AMSAT report. The AMSAT 39th Space Symposium and Annual Meeting, planned as an in-person event, will now be a virtual event on October 30th due to the lingering effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. This is an opportunity for amateur radio and space enthusiasts from around the world to learn more about AMSAT's strategic plan, the golf program, the CubeSat simulator, and other exciting developments in the amateur satellite world. AMSAT President Robert Bankston, KE4AL, said AMSAT members had voiced concern over the continued COVID-19 pandemic and the risks associated with long-distance travel, as well as attendance at large group gatherings. Those who have already registered for the symposium will automatically receive refunds. AMSAT will host its 2021 AMSAT Virtual Space Symposium and Annual General Meeting via Zoom on Saturday, October 30th, 1400 to 2200 UTC. It will be available to the general public on AMSAT's YouTube channel at no cost. 
The event will be a combination of pre-recorded video segments along with live question and answer sessions. The AMSAT report comes to us each week courtesy of Bruce Page, KK5DO. And now, with his segment on tower climbing and antenna safety, here is Arizona's own Greg Stoddard, KF9MP. One question I got via email concerning tower mounted electronics and where to start. Here's what I did on my latest 900 megahertz install. Concerning feed lines, I use the 900 megahertz band for a one-way link between my recording studio at home and the local repeater for airing this week in amateur radio. Feed line loss at 900 megahertz is horrible unless you intend to spend lots of money on pressurized semi-rigid feed line. One solution to this problem is to mount the electronics on the tower and limit the feed line to say two or three feet. It's easy to run 115 volts AC up the tower. Make sure the wires you choose to install are the outdoor type with three wires. Also check with the tower owner to be sure it's legal to do so. Probably any lighted or registered tower would require you to, to run the power wires through conduit. Actually, running conduit on the tower is rather easily since it's generally in a straight line. Okay, so you've installed the power to the place where you intend to mount the electronics and antenna. Your next job is to find a suitable cabinet. If your space requirements are small, like the size of a small HF rig, you're in luck. For those needing to obtain and tower mount a larger cabinet, here's how I handled a couple of those projects. First, we gathered all the equipment to be put in the cabinet on the tower and arranged it to take up minimal space but allow sufficient cooling airflow. Then we located a cabinet that came close to the size and height and width. I took it to a local welding shop and had them cut all the way around the outside, splicing five inches of steel to make it deeper. After the bill was paid, I sealed it with silicone and paint and tested it with a water hose for a watertight seal. I did install two drain holes in the bottom just in case. For smaller projects, marine battery cases work well for housing tower mounted electronics. You'll need a mounting bracket of some sort and some holes in the box, but they're cheap and durable. Ham fests are good places to look to pick up plastic boxes for outside mounting. I found several with molded in nuts for mounting, clear plastic doors with key locks for real cheap, my favorite two words. Some common mounting devices for electronics on the tower are hose clamps, antenna U-bolts, most brass screws and nuts, as well as custom-made brackets from scrap steel. If you live in an area with a large industrial area, try to get to know someone that works as an industrial electrician who can help you scrounge old steel electrical cabinets, scrap steel, wire, and other hardware. Most of my best outdoor installations were made from old control cabinets destined for the scrap steel bin or the landfill. And while you're building your tower mounted box, be sure to consider how to safely put it on the tower and gain access to it. Remember, money spent on books and videos relating to tower safety is always money well spent. Invest in your safety soon. Don't be a statistic. This is Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. The Voice of Freedom transmitted its first words from Westchester, Ohio, across the ocean in September of 1944, at the then new Bethany Relay Station of the Voice of America. The Westchester Amateur Radio Association, WC8VOA, which calls the iconic building its home, is celebrating the Relay Station's birthday this year with a special event station on September 25th and 26th. Joyce Lynn Brault, KD8VRX-VA2VRX, said that the club shack is actually the original control room for the Relay Station. For the special event, be listening on 20 and 40 meters for single sideband, FT8, and perhaps some CW as well. Those making a QSO are eligible for a downloadable certificate available 24 hours after the event closes operation. The Federal Communications Commission has adopted rules that make 1200 megahertz of spectrum in the 6 gigahertz band, 5.925 to 7.125 gigahertz, available for unlicensed use. These new rules will usher in Wi-Fi 6, the next generation of Wi-Fi, and play a major role in the growth of the Internet of Things. Wi-Fi 6 will be over two and a half times faster than the current standard and will offer better performance for American consumers. Opening the 6 GHz band for unlicensed use will also increase the amount of spectrum available for Wi-Fi by nearly a factor of five and help improve rural connectivity.
The 6 gigahertz band is currently populated by, among others, microwave services that are used to support utilities, public safety, and wireless backhaul. Unlicensed devices will share the spectrum with incumbent licensed services under rules crafted to protect those licensed services and enable both unlicensed and licensed operations to thrive throughout the band. The report and order authorizes indoor low power operations over the full 1200 MHz and standard power devices in 850 MHz of the 6 GHz band. An automated frequency coordination system will prevent standard power access points from operating where they could cause interference to incumbent services. The further notice of proposed rulemaking seeks comment on a proposal to permit very low power devices to operate across the 6 GHz band to support high data rate applications including high performance wearable augmented reality and virtual reality devices. The notice also seeks comment on increasing the power at which low power indoor access points may operate. Unlicensed devices that employ Wi-Fi and other unlicensed standards have become indispensable for providing low-cost wireless connectivity in countless products used by American consumers. In making broad swaths of the 6 GHz spectrum available for unlicensed use, the FCC envisions new innovative technologies and services that will deliver new devices and applications to American consumers and advance the Commission's goal of making broadband connectivity available to all Americans, especially those in rural and underserved areas. Members of the Helvetia Telegraphy Club will activate the call sign Hotel Bravo 9 Hotel Charlie Stroke Aeronautical Mobile in the air from a hot air balloon. Hans Peter, Hotel Bravo 9 Bravo X-Ray Echo, informs us that the team's planned activation date is Tuesday, September the 14th. However, there are a number of alternative dates, Wednesday the 15th, Thursday the 16th and Saturday the 18th. The balloon flight will be two hours long, within a window of 0530 to 09 hours UTC. The hot air balloon ride is very dependent on the weather. The probability that a trip will take place on the scheduled date is only around 50% and the decision about it will be made at short notice. The web team will try to keep the information up to date on QRZ.com in a timely manner. Operators involved in the flight are Eurus, Hotel Bravo 9, Alpha Bravo Oscar, Hans Peter, Hotel Bravo 9, Bravo X-Ray Echo, Uli, Hotel Bravo 9, Charlie Golf Alpha, Peter, Hotel Bravo 9, Tango Vic Tequilo, and Thomas, Hotel Bravo 9, Bravo Sierra Hotel. The equipment is a KX3 with 15 watts into antennas for 40, 30 and 20 meters, which will be hanging vertically beneath the balloon. Other bands may be possible. It is advisable to consult the network of reverse beacons or a cluster to locate the active frequency. For example, try www.reversebeacon.net. You'll be able to track the exact position of the balloon via APRS. A special balloon card QSL will be available via the Bureau. For more details and photos, look up Hotel Bravo 9 Hotel Charlie on QRZ.com. Starting on October 1st, Amateur radio on the International Space Station will accept applications from U.S. schools, museums, service centers, and community youth organizations individually or working together interested in hosting amateur radio contacts with crew members on the International Space Station. Contacts will be scheduled between July 1st and December 31st, 2022. Crew scheduling and ISS orbits will determine the exact contact dates. ARIES is looking for organizations that will draw a sizable number of participants and integrate the contact into a well-developed education plan. The deadline to submit is November 24th. Proposal information and more details, including expectations, proposal guidelines, and a proposal form are on the ARIES U.S. website. An ARIES introductory webinar will be on October 7th at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. You can sign up via Eventbrite. Each year, ARIES provides tens of thousands of students with opportunities to learn about space technologies and communications through amateur radio. Crew members aboard the International Space Station will participate in scheduled amateur radio contacts. These contacts are approximately 10 minutes long 
and allow students to interact with the astronaut through a question and answer session. The program offers learning opportunities by connecting students to orbiting astronauts through a partnership that includes the ARRL, AMSAT, and NASA, as well as other radio organizations, and space agencies in Russia, Canada, Japan, and Europe. The program's goal is to inspire students to pursue interests and careers in science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and amateur radio. Educators overwhelmingly report that the student participation in the ARIES program stimulates interest in STEM subjects and in STEM careers, ARIES said in announcing the contact opportunities. ARIES says enthusiasm sparked by the school contact may also lead to an interest in amateur radio among students and the creation of ham clubs in schools. Some educators have even become radio amateurs after experiencing a contact with the ISS crew member. ARIES is celebrating 20 years of continuous amateur radio operations on the International Space Station. Contact ARIES US for additional information. December 11th, 1921 was a significant day for amateur radio. It was the day of the transatlantic test project when HAM's shortwave frequencies showed themselves to be capable of transatlantic radio communication, even at 200 meters or less. The experimental transmission of station 1BCG using a tube-based transmitter was conducted by the Radio Club of America on 1.3 megahertz and resulted in successful reception in Scotland. 100 years later, December 11, 2021, will be an equally significant day. A replica of that transmitter will be used to reenact that CW transmission on 160 meters, not far from the spot in Connecticut from which the original CW transmission was sent. Long-time Antique Wireless Association member Bob Raid, W2ZM, now a silent key, built the replica for a special event 25 years ago. Antique Wireless Association volunteers have spent lots of time lately refurbishing it, wiring a plate supply, building a filament power supply, and sorting out usable tubes. For a day that comes along once every 100 years, radio operators and the transmitter need to be ready. Antique Wireless Association trustee Joe Stoltz, K2AEI, said, We have had the transmitter powered up and are able to get 350 watts on 160 meters with one amplifier tube. The next step is to construct a 160 meter antenna so we can do some actual on-air testing before December. Meanwhile, the Radio Society of Great Britain also has plans for the centenary for the first transatlantic personal message between radio amateurs. Nick Totterdell, G4FAL, the Society's HF Contest Committee Chairman, said that the ARRL and RSGB members are organizing a number of activities surrounding the anniversary. There will also be a transatlantic CUSO party to be held on the 13th and 14th of November, being sponsored by the Radio Club of America. Nick went on to say that other activities will be disclosed soon on the Society's website and will appear in the Society's Radcom magazine. The Society is hoping to maximize participation in the U.S. and U.K. and increase worldwide awareness of this achievement 100 years ago. Recently, the South African Radio League, SARL, presented amateur radio's frequency requirements during the three days long public hearing about the draft National Radio Frequency Plan being tabled by their regulator, ICASA. The main points of the SARL presentation were about the 160 metre amateur band and the omission of the amateur allocation in the 40 megahertz band. Hans van der Gronendal, Zulu Sierra 6 Alpha Kilo Victor, reminded ICASA about an agreement reached a few years ago to allocate 1.81 to 2.0 MHz to the amateur service. This was, however, not taken up in a previous draft frequency plan, even though SARL reminded ICASA of the agreement at an earlier liaison meeting. The SARL was assured that this would be corrected. The current draft only shows an amateur allocation of 1.81 to 1.85 MHz. Currently, radio amateurs in South Africa still have access to the full 1.81 to 2.0 MHz, as per Annex 1 of the current radio frequency regulations, published on the 31st of March 2015. The other major point of discussion was the emission of the 40 MHz band. Amateur radio has an allocation of 40.675 to 40.685 MHz for propagation research. 
the SARL suggests that this may have been an oversight and asked ICASA to correct this. While it is currently not in the draft frequency plan, radio amateurs in South Africa are still licensed to use the 40 MHz band as per Schedule 1 of the current radio regulations. In his presentation, ZS6AKV told the hearing that currently a beacon is operating in Polokwane and that some interesting reports were recently received from a station in the UK. With the new sunspot cycle, this frequency is of importance for sporadic E and other propagation mode studies. Recently, the regulator in the States, the FCC, issued two amateurs with experimental licenses to carry out propagation studies. Currently, there are discussions with the USA amateurs to launch a joint propagation study project with South Africa. This band is also of interest to carry out meteor scatter studies and the possible application of meteor scatter to monitor the SARL next generation beacons. The SARL also proposed to ICASA to reconsider the power limit of 1 watt EIRP on 135.7 to 137.8 and 472 to 479 kilohertz and to allow 26 dBW instead. That's about 400 watts. Concerning the 60 meter band, the SARL requested that for clarity, the frequencies 5350 to 5450 kHz and 5290 kHz should be shown on the main table and not just in a footnote as at present. The chairperson of the hearing, Councillor Peter Zimri, thanked the SARL for the concise and clear presentation. There were no questions from the panel nor the public. It's now over to ICASA to consider the SARL proposal. The next stage will be the publication of the final National Radio Frequency Plan. RTTY service, ham radio teletype, service station K6KPH, operating from the Maritime Radio Historical Society, is officially back on the air. K6KPH also transmits W1AW qualifying run texts and the W1AW field day bulletin, the station was off the air due to COVID-19 restrictions and antenna damage. Repairs to the transmitter site in Bolinas, California were performed under a U.S. National Park Service grant and support from the Maritime Radio Historical Society. Years of damage from decaying poles, failing cross arms, and falling trees necessitated the repair, Maritime Radio Historical Society said. The next West Coast qualifying run to be transmitted from the K6KPH station is scheduled for Saturday, September 25th, 2011, 2021 rather, at 2100 UTC at 3851, 7047.5, 1407.5, 1809 7.5, and 21067.5 kilohertz. <laughs> Produced by amateurs for amateurs and originating from Albany, New York. You're listening to This Week in Amateur Radio. The smaller the battery, the more powerful are its possibilities. The designers of a new battery technology being used as a fitness tracker would like to think so. California-based SILA created the battery for a wristband tracker that experts say could revolutionize everyday electronics and perhaps have implication for modes of transportation too. For now, the ultra-tiny powerhouses are in a niche market item and a fitness tracker called the Whoop 4.0. According to a New York Times article, the battery has the same lifespan as the power source used in the previous model, but that's a whole one-third one smaller in size. Sela and Whoop together said the battery has the potential for mass marketing and other devices in the next couple of years. Unlike lithium-ion batteries, which rely on the ionization and movement of lithium atoms, these new batteries use an anode made of silicon instead of graphite, requiring smaller space for the lithium atoms as they move from the anode side of the battery to the cathode. Sela and another company, QuantumScape, has told the New York paper that their batteries will likely be used in a few short years in smart eyeglasses, electric cars, and maybe even flying cars one day. Here's this week's listing of upcoming ARRL Learning Network webinars, a members-only benefit. To register, check out upcoming webinars, and to view previously recorded sessions, please visit the ARRL Learning Network webinar page. ARRL members may register for upcoming presentations and view previously recorded Learning Network webinars. 
ARRL affiliated radio clubs may also use the recordings as presentations for club meetings, mentoring new and current hams, and discussing amateur radio topics. Working the Pile Up, presented by Ron Delpierre Smith, KD9 IPO, will be presented on Tuesday, October 5th, 2021, at 1 p.m. Eastern. That's 1700 UTC. Ron Delpierre Smith, KD9 IPO, Vice President of the Chicago Suburban Radio Association and an ARRL Assistant Section Manager in Illinois, will offer an enlightening discussion on working a pileup from both sides of the contact. Whether your interest lies in ARRL field day, contesting, special events, or rare DX, this is a must-see presentation. Ron will discuss search and pounce and running techniques, when to use them, and some tips on working them to your advantage. The ARRL Learning Network schedule is subject to change. Amateur radio on the International Space Station has received recognition from NASA's Human Exploration and Operations Mission Directorate for its accomplishments in promoting science, technology, electronics, and mathematics initiatives through amateur radio. The Human Exploration and Operations Mission Directorate provides leadership and management of NASA space operations, such as developing rockets and spacecraft that will contribute to human exploration in and beyond low Earth orbit. Astronaut Shannon Walker, KD5DXB, and Soichi Noguchi, KD5TVP, at NA1SS during the ISS contact with Hisagi Junior High School in Sushi, Japan. NASA Space Communications and Navigation Networks enable NASA to inspire the next generation of scientists, engineers, and explorers, even from 350 kilometers above Earth, said Catherine Luters, NASA Associate Administrator for Human Exploration and Operations, in a LinkedIn post. In addition to connecting to the science community on Earth with the groundbreaking research studies and experiments aboard the International Space Station, the Space Communications and Navigation Network enables the space station to act as a unique platform for global STEM outreach and education efforts. For over 20 years, the Amateur Radio on the International Space Station program, a nonprofit supported by the Space Communications and Navigation Network, has connected classrooms on Earth with astronauts aboard the space station, allowing students to engage directly with astronauts in real time. Working with an amateur radio club on the ground, the ham radio stations on board the ISS enable students to ask the crew questions about life in space and what it takes to become an astronaut. In preparation for their Aries contact, students explore a variety of STEM activities through space exploration, radio communications, and wireless technologies. With tens of thousands of student participants each year, the Aries program plays an important role in inspiring the, the Artemis generation and encouraging students to pursue STEM careers, Luter said. And finally this week, radio station WBZ in Boston on 1030 kilohertz is celebrating its 100th anniversary. The station began full-time broadcasting on September 19, 1921, making it one of America's oldest radio stations. WBZ AM 1030 is a Class A 50 kilowatt directional facility using two towers on the opposite of Nantasket Beach, Massachusetts. For a station to broadcast for 100 years is nothing short of amazing, said Alan Chartrand, market president of WBZ parent iHeart Media in Boston. Listeners consistently utilize this heritage brand as evidenced by WBZ's continued rating success. People lean into objective news sources to remain informed, and none has been more dependable than WBZ. With FM accessibility via WXKS-FM 107.9 HD2, the primary listener connectivity point for WBZ remains its booming AM signal, which covers all of eastern Massachusetts, Rhode Island, southern New Hampshire, and coastal Maine. At night, WBZ signal expands to much of the Northeast. While a Class A, it shares that designation with Port-au-Prince Haiti radio station Radio Telegonin on the same frequency. The WBZ of today features all news programming from midnight to 8 p.m. weekdays and nightside with Dan Rhea from 8 p.m. until midnight. Saturday evenings feature talk programming, while the Rick Edelman Show holds the 10 a.m. to noon Sunday slot. WBZ is one of the original Westinghouse radio stations and has been at its present dial position since 1941. It was a member of the NBC Blue Network and then switched in 1942 to the Red Network. That lasted until August 1956, when a dispute over daytime programming led WBZ to take on a middle-of-the-road music approach.
At this time, legendary hosts including Dave Maynard entered the WBZ Annals of History. In the 1960s, WBZ became a top 40 station, competing with WMEX. But in 1969, WRKO had emerged as the market's hit music leader. This led WBZ, even with its much bigger regional signal, to shift toward adult contemporary as it adopted a more full-service approach, incorporating sports programming and talk shows. In 1985, as many AMs were doing, full-service programming gradually faded. By the time the Persian Gulf War began in 1991, all music programming was done. This resulted in WBZ becoming, and adopting the slogan, Boston's News Station. Meanwhile, WBZ's ownership was still associated with the old Westinghouse, this time as a CBS radio property with Viacom, a part of its historical ownership lineage. With CBS Radio's merger with Entercom, now Odyssey, in 2017, the company opted to swap WBZ, along with a group of other stations, to iHeartMedia. Amateur radio operators can participate as well. The Bellarica Amateur Radio Society and the Hampton County Radio Association will commemorate the anniversary with a special event starting on September 17th at 1300 UTC and wrapping up on September 20th at 0359 UTC. Look for W1W, W1B, W1Z, and WB1Z on all bands, single sideband, AM, CW, and digital modes. New England operators interested in operating one of the special event stations should contact Larry Cranson, W1AST. Many of the news and information items heard on This Week in Amateur Radio have been provided by the American Radio Relay League, the ARRL Letter, the ARRL Audio News, the Southgate Amateur Radio News Service, Southgate Vibes, AMSAT, the Radio Amateurs of Canada, the FCC, the Radio Society of Great Britain, and Ofcom the SARL, the International Amateur Radio Union, the Wireless Institute of Australia, the Amateur Radio Newsline, the International Telecommunications Union, and various news sources on the Internet. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard on nets and repeaters all across North America and around the world on great repeater systems like our flagship repeater K2RHI on 146.940 MHz serving the Tri-Cities of New York State's Capital Region from Mount Refinesk in Brunswick, New York. This Week in Amateur Radio is produced by Community Video Associates Incorporated. Now for the staff of This Week in Amateur Radio, this is Jeff Rahner, WB2AEQ, saying 73 until next week.